It's time now for Mark Meets, in which I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, showbiz, business, sport and beyond. Tonight, one of the most respected and experienced journalists in the country, Michael Crick, legendary political reporter at the BBC, including a long and revered stint at Newsnight, followed by Channel 4 News. He's also the best-selling biographer of Geoffrey Archer, Sir Alex Ferguson and our very own Nigel Farage. What does he think of Nigel? Michael Crick, welcome to GB News. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Mark. I'll hold fire on the Nigel question for starters, but let's talk about your career. Uh, you're a very versatile man. There are lots of things you could have done. And you were courted, I believe, by the Labour Party at one point as a potential parliamentary candidate. So why journalism and not politics? Well, until about the age of 30, that was my plan, to start off in journalism and then leap into politics. But um, <clears throat> I suppose the Labour Party in the 1980s was, you know, pretty left-wing. I mean, Tony Blair managed it, but I don't have his skills. And uh, I was approached about the possibility, only the possibility, of being the candidate for Labour in a by-election in Bootle on Merseyside. It was, at the time, was the safest Labour seat in England. Right. And, uh, in fact, it was the second by-election they had in one year. Kinnock the leader? Uh, yes, around about... Yes, Neil Kinnock was the leader. And, uh, well, it's difficult for me, a Mancunian to go and, uh, and a supporter of Manchester United, to go and uh, become an MP on Merseyside. The, the, it was clear that the Bootle Labour Party were at war with each other. Um, and, uh, frankly, my wife, uh, my then wife, didn't, um, didn't really... She'd worked on, in Liverpool, didn't fancy going back to Merseyside. And so I, it, I had 24 hours to make my mind up. And I decided against it. And I then knew that this was the turning point in my life, that... Actually, if I wasn't going to go for Bootle, I wasn't really going to go anywhere. And I really, after 10 years as a journalist at that stage, I decided I prefer journalism. And I don't really regret that. Um, I mean, occasionally I have a twinge thinking, gosh, you know, I could, I, you know, maybe I could have been a minister. But I suspect I would have just been a troublesome backbencher and got nowhere because wouldn't, we wouldn't have been willing to suck up to either Tony Blair or Gordon Brown, which is what one had to do in the, uh, you know, the, the years that Labour was in power. Instead, you were a troublesome journalist, a, a wonderful disruptor. And I think I became a better journalist after that because I wasn't worrying about, you know, it was wrong of you me. Didn't really. have to, you didn't have yeah, to worry exactly, about your exactly. blotting your copybook. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you weren't going into, you know, the ref wasn't <laughs> going to give you a yellow card. I think I'm mixing my metaphors, but you get the point. So, uh, you know, wonderfully tenacious uh, interviewer and reporter, very dogged. Where does that come from? I don't know, really. You're a well, scrapper. Do you I, like a fight? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I think in my character is that I have this, it's a strange thing. I've got uh, triplet sisters and they're two years younger than me. And I think growing up uh, with them around... Um, outnumbered. I was outnumbered, but I had to you know, fight my corner. And I think I managed, uh, I managed to survive, at least. I think it made me a more aggressive person. I think at times I was too aggressive. I mean, looking back on some of the things I did, I did go a bit too far. I've perhaps mellowed a bit in recent years. But I think, I think that, was a, that was a factor. Yeah. But I think you were chasing the story and you were chasing the truth, weren't you? Oh, well, I like to think I was, and sometimes I found it, and sometimes I didn't. And I think, uh, you know, I think we have a duty as journalists uh, to put... To, to put uh, people on the spot, politicians, people in power, uh, to get them to account for themselves. But we've got to do it in a courteous manner, I think. Um, and we've got to do it, I think, the other consideration is we've got to do it in such a way as that we don't want to put them off going into politics. We need good people in politics. You only have to look at the current government to see, you know, we're, they're desperately short of good people. Labour are short of good people as well. Um, but we, we as journalists do have that duty. And I think there was a time 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, when I started out, when the political journalists, the lobby as it's known at Westminster, were far too deferential to the politicians. That's all changed. If anything, they're, you know, they're not res they need to be a slightly more respectful. But, uh, uh, and you look around and football journalists are sort of now, uh, they're still deferential and they're at the stage yeah. that political journalists were 40 years ago. Especially Ferguson's journalists. <laughs> but we'll come to Fergie, uh, subject of one of your brilliant biographies and one of your heroes. But uh, what about the culture of broadcasting? Um, because you were at the Beeb for a long time at Newsnight. And then you moved to Channel 4. So how did the organisations differ from your point of view as a working journalist? 
Well, not much, actually. Everybody says, oh, the BBC and, uh, you know, Channel 4 News, which is part of ITN and part of the commercial sector, really, mm. um, you know, they must have been vastly different. No, but they were both incredibly inefficient places. Um, bureaucratic. Uh, sorry? Bureaucratic. Bure incredibly bureaucratic. And mm. uh, you had to go through all sorts of uh, uh, procedures to get your expenses and to, you know, book... book, book Accommodation for conferences and things like that, and uh, the, the um, no, they were they were very similar, and I had sort of roughly twenty years um, in each, and I had good times in both of them. Uh, some of the public have fallen out of love with BBC. I think we've just got to put it out there. Uh, well, they, I, they, I, they've always been. It's always had been its a large sceptical. Yes. Uh, do you do you think that the BBC faces? An existential crisis. Uh, we know we've got a government it's that doesn't got... view it favourably, and, and it could be that the licence fee is not long for this world. But what about the wider authority and popularity of the Beeb? Is it a concern? Because I do get a lot of emails from viewers saying that they don't like the Beeb because they think it was um, very partisan during Brexit, uh, that perhaps it's been the Boris bashing corporation. Now, I know there'll be as many emails saying they were too hard on Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> but, but, but what is your view about that? Do you address those concerns seriously as a former BBC man? Well, I, I actually gave a lecture about this a, a year or two ago in which I said I thought that both the BBC, for whom I worked, and Channel 4 News, for whom I worked, um, had been um, uh, rather biased um, and been uh, particularly on the, the issue of Brexit and, on, and also the treatment of the Conservative uh, governments of, of, of the last few years, and that at times it became uh, almost like a crusade. And, I mean, I, I grew up in a culture where my editor at ITN in the 1980s, Sir David Nicholas, who only died, sadly, uh, a few weeks ago in, in his 90s, he had the view that you had to be utterly impartial and balanced and that if we got an exclusive interview with God, the first duty of the news desk was be to ring up Satan's office and ask him if he would appear <laughs> and give him the right to reply. And, um, I mean, it's a laugh, but it, it, it illustrates the yes. point, really. And I think on Brexit, we, uh, we got it badly wrong because we didn't understand, as journalists in the BBC or in Channel 4 News or in ITV and, and Sky as well, just the strength of feeling out there, partly because we all come from, these days anyway, when I started out, actually, most television journalists hadn't been to university, or probably, uh, whereas now, nearly all, it's almost a requirement now that you should have gone to university. You, you know, they mostly come from middle class, metropolitan, uh, southern backgrounds, and there was a real, there's, there's a real lack of people um, in uh, television news and television journalism, you know, who understand what it's like in Barrow in Furness or Hartlepool or Tyneside or, uh, you know, or, or, the, uh, or Doncaster or the, or the coal fields. And, of course, it was those areas that were strongest, uh, strongest for Brexit. And, indeed, I, I, my, my philosophy has always been to be a reporter, get out on the road, yeah. go to places, talk to people. And I think I saw Brexit coming a few weeks before most of my colleagues did. I mean, I'm not going to claim any huge foresight, but uh, you could see the way things uh, were, were going. And it became as a huge shock to people in the newsrooms. You know, the same thing happens whenever um, a right-wing contender like, like George Bush Sr. or Donald Trump or yep. earlier Ronald Reagan wins in America. A lot of journalists here, I thought, gosh, you know, that was a surprise. And it's because the only places they go to... It surprised Hillary Clinton, didn't it? <laughs> the, the only places yeah. they go to in America are Washington, New York, right. LA, San Francisco... Where there's a consensus. Where there's a lot of liberal people. And they don't actually go to the, frankly, boring towns in the middle of nowhere where people are, you know, are much strongly vote Republican. And, 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 uh, and, and so it's, it's a failing on the, on the, behalf, on the part of, of many. And I talk as, you know, I can, I can, I can admit it now because I'm no longer part of that world of impartial uh, broadcasting. I mean, I'm a Remainer. I'm not a passionate Remainer, but I, mm. I, would remo I would, if I could press a button and reverse Brexit, I would. But I do think we were unfair... Uh, in, in a lot of that debate. And the, the, there's, the, there, is a bi there was a bias against Brexit in broadcast. I think it's been corrected a lot of it, since, certainly by the BBC uh, more recently. And I think you see the same kind of biases in another area where I'm active, which is in higher education, that, that there are people in higher education these days who do support Brexit, and they do support... Uh, they do vote Conservative, but they keep quiet about it. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I saw the same in television. And if, if there are people in an institution 
who feel they have to keep quiet about their, about their true views. That is really worrying, I think, in a liberal society. It's a bad place. It's bad for the media, bad for plurality, and uh, bad for exactly. our democracy. Yeah. I completely agree. Pluralism is these, my watchword. These you know? forces uh, uh, about which the, uh, the sort of metropolitan elite, as it were, are so ashamed will only get stronger if silenced. And that's the issue, isn't it? And that's why you need a national conversation. At GB News, we try to widen the conversation, which is why I'd like to offer you a contract. Are you available? <laughs> Well, you see, the problem is... <laughs> I, Look I, at you, wriggling I, on I, the I, line. No, no, no. In fact, I was... A, very early on when GB News was being mooted, um, I was approached about whether I'd be, be interested. And I was told it would be impartial. Well, you're not really. You're on the right. We well, you say no, you I've are. Got, I've got a trio of lefties on the panel today. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, to, 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 to come here on a regular, you know, as a contract or become a reporter or a presenter or whatever... Would, would go against what I, the, the, the battle, really, that I fought uh, it, at Channel 4 News. Well, I guess News. it's a different style of broadcasting, and isn't I, it? And, and it, it's mm. tricky, really, because in the end, you're not going to be able to keep impartiality, I don't think, in broadcasting, because in the end, anybody can set up a, a radio station or a television station anywhere in the world, on the internet, and if, it, if it's popular, everybody will watch well, it. Well, I think you're right, and, and, and actually, you know, just to clarify, our bulletins, are, we've got an amazing bulletin team, and they are impartial, they deliver the news bulletins, and you have presenters at GB News who have an opinion which is then debated with contrarian voices, and so you're absolutely right. We, we, you know, what we do is we're, we're a current affairs debating channel, and we debate everything, but... It's well, you, fa you found a way around the rules, basically, because it, what, it's complicated. But the Ofcom rules say that so long as you have one person on the other side, you're OK. And you, even if you have eight person, people on one side and one person on the other. And I just think those rules are absurd. Uh, and you, you do need, uh, and, and you need to be impartial and balanced as much as the BBC does. Uh, or Channel 4 News or uh, ITV or, or, or anybody. But I, I, I'm losing this battle and, and it will be lost in the long term for the reasons I've just explained. Well, for sure. Now, um, let's uh, very briefly, the clock's against us. Uh, let's talk about two men. Sir Alex Ferguson, your hero, and you spent a lot of time writing his life story. Uh, what, what are the aspects to Sir Alex Ferguson that you discovered that we don't know? Well... Uh, he's like all the people, most of the people I've uh, written about, Geoffrey Archer, uh, Alex Ferguson, Nigel Farage, um, you know, I call them sort of charming monsters in a sort of, um, uh, you know, teasing manner, in that they have very, very positive sides to their character mm. and very, very negative sides. And some people only see one side and they don't see the, the other. Um, and some people do, do see both. And the, 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 in the case of Ferguson, he was undoubtedly a brilliant manager, uh, you know, the greatest that British football has seen uh, so far, although Pep Guardiola is um, <laughs> catching up. Um, but there was a darker side to him. You know, the way that he could be a, an appalling bully at times. Um, needlessly but, so sometimes. Uh, needlessly so sometimes. And he would cut people off and never speak to them again. He, I, I think there are, there are serious questions that, frankly, the football journalists fail to ask about the relationship with his son, who was a football agent. And he was, I, I've explained in my book, how he pushed... Uh, young players at United, you know, people are only 15, 16, mm. to sign up with his son. Now, that's wrong. Um, and I also think that he was partly responsible for the mess that United are in now and the way in which the club got taken over by the Glazer family, um, who have sucked a huge sum of money out of the, out of the club. And he didn't put enough thought into uh, planning the succession uh, either. But the, the sale of the club to the Glazers all stem from... Uh, a row he had with the so-called Coolmore Mafia over a racehorse. Yeah. It's a long... Way back in the history of time, but he was gifted, United fans he was gifted, will, will gifted, remember the story. He gifted a horse, wasn't he, and then it went <laughs> yeah, to court. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, but what is amazing about him briefly is that he... That last Premier League that he won, was that yeah. his 11th 2013. title? 2013. Uh, was it the 13th, wasn't it? Uh, hang on. So. I, 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 yes, it was. We'd won seven, seven leagues before yeah, Ferguson. He won, he won 13, yeah. And it's remarkable. That was his last one. And he, he won it with a crap team. Well, so with he, Ferguson, he frequently he would, won the league with teams that weren't that great. He was such a good manager. You, you, and this guy, Ferguson, yeah. he gives you 20 points before the season starts. Well, a good manager gets, you know, it, 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 gets more than, than the sum of the team's parts. A yeah. bad manager you know, has great players and they don't play well. No. And Ferguson got the best out of people. He was an amazing judge of character. You know, he would do all sorts of work to find out if 
his players, when he, before he signed them, had the strength, the mental strength to play at United. Because not everybody... It's a, you know, the pressure at United is huge compared with virtually any other club in the world. And only certain players can do it. And Ferguson would do, put an amazing amount of work into that. Uh, and, and to, but, I mean, he was an incredibly talented... I always say of Ferguson, he would have been successful in any walk of life apart from diplomacy. You know, he, he was a businessman at one point. He was a trade union leader at one point. And, and a, a, small and a pub, pub owner. And well. a pub owner, yeah. Although uh, some pretty dodgy things went on in his pub, as he explains in his own memoirs. Well, look, it's amazing. <laughs> a true icon. Uh, now, last but not least, Nigel. Yes. Of this parish. <laughs> yes. In fact, he interviewed me the other day, a few yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, it was a great interview. <laughs> so, um, what, what, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts about Nigel? He has... Well, he's the most transformative and significant politician uh, of the last few decades yeah. who wasn't an MP, yep. wasn't prime wasn't a minister. minister. No, and no. it's difficult to think of a similar figure like that in British history. He's an amazing communicator. I say, I mean, a lot of politicians are good in one sense. I mean, take Michael Heseltine, brilliant on a, co a, co a conference platform, but he hated, you know, talking to ordinary members of the public. Boris Johnson, actually, is a bit the same. Whereas Farage is great on a platform, he's great on the radio and telly, and you're now, uh, your company's now using that, a wonderful broadcaster, really. He's a great, but he's great on the street, and he likes actually engaging with people on the street. But, but, but... He is utterly ruthless. I mean, you know, he could give lessons to Stalin or Pol Pot, frankly, in, in the way he used to run his party or parties mm. and purge people, uh, you know, if he felt they were a bit of a threat. In fact, he made the same mistake as Ferguson, really. He didn't plan the succession. And therefore, you have, you, a bit like, you know, this thought's only just occurred to me, actually. That, you know, UKIP post-Farage went through a whole succession of leaders in the same way United have gone through a whole succession of managers. Uh, Michael, I know you're going to need time and support, but that GB News contract's in the post. <laughs> so uh, don't shred it before uh, reflecting carefully, because we'd love to have you. Uh, what, a, what an absolute legend of, of television, broadcasting, of journalism, biographer as well. Michael Crick, thank you so much for your time. Do come back and see thank us you. again soon.